Hey, you know me, I love talking about board games. So what are we talking about today? We're talking a little bit something off of Liege general topics, but uh, since Essen is going to be within the next uh, week or so, uh, I thought I'd be talking a little bit about the top 10 games that I think are most anticipated in general to speak, but also things that are going to sort of uh, go across borders in terms of what you like and what I like. So a little bit of broad spectrum interest there. Let's do this. Now, you may remember the designer, Vladimir Suki. I'm not pronouncing that last name right, but what you may know him from, Pulsar 2849, Underwater Cities, Praga Caput Regni, most recently, Messiana 1347, and now Woodcraft, where you are craftsmen of wood, obtaining resources, resource manipulation, upgrading your capacities as you go in sort of an action wheel selection-based manner. The rule book is already online, so if you're interested in this one, not only can you read through how this action wheel, income board, and reputation tracks are going to determine who is the winner overall, but you can get a good sense of what the flow of the game is going to look like, the action overview, everything that you're going to need to know on this very, very intriguing looking wheel. You can already go through the actions as well as the end game of how you're going to be combining these resources and these actions to score the most points at the end. You can also already pre-order it on many major marketing websites and the Board Game Geek forums have already been responsive in the sense that Rio Grande Games is going to be doing the US import for this one that they're projecting in early 2023. So if that sounds good to you from a dice selection that you can whittle down as well as build back up with wood manipulation as your resource. Check this one out as number one. Now, number two here, again, you're going to probably recognize it's been on the hotness for a while. And, well, it's dealing with death and music all wrapped up into one. Mozart's last requiem in D minor. After Mozart dies at the age of 34, you are going to be trying to finish his last masterpiece in this game. And again, this is going to be played over a series of five rounds uh, where you're going to be doing different stages of the composer's life, carrying out each turn-by-turn -turn basis, where you're going to have cards that are going to carry out different actions and using them acquire style or story points for the upcoming round. Similarly to Woodcraft, amazingly, Lacrimosa also has their rule book up on Board Game Geek, so you can see how the different phases and the player turns are going to be affected, what's optional, what's going to be your action by action selection, how you're going to be utilizing your actions in the different phases, and ultimately what's going to get you the most victory points at the end. Limited hand carry over affecting the next rounds and subsequent eras to reset your strategy each time. I'm relatively intrigued, especially as a non-Euro person in the first place. Early reviews are relatively positive as well, so we'll kind of see what hammers out as we get closer to the vinyl release. Next up, number three. Now, this one doesn't need a whole lot of introduction, but this is the next iteration of Great Western Trail, right? Only this is Arjun. Tina. 19th century, travel the plains of the Pampas using your cattle to be delivered from the main train station in Buenos Aires. It's going to be similar. It's going to have deck management. It's going to have your rondel as well as the ability to upgrade your player boards. But you have farmers, which are your new workers. Uh, you can also strengthen your cows. All right. Like who doesn't want to have stronger cows than your opponent, right? And then you can also unlock shortcuts that are going to get your cows there more quickly. But it's going to require sacrifice because nothing comes without a cost. Is this going to be different enough for you from the original Great Western Trail if you are one of those people who is a fan of it, interested in it, or is this going to be better than it? Do you need both is really the question. And we'll see as we get more hands-on when it goes live at Essen. Number four over here. This one I've talked about previously a couple times. I think this is going to be something that's gonna be make it or break it. And what we're seeing here is the first iteration of a cooperative Carcassonne. Mists over Carcassonne is now how it is translated from German into English. You're working together to place these tiles, score points while trying to stop the spread of, well, you know, as, as much as I think of Carcassonne, I don't really think of ghosts, but that's where you're going with this one, right? And you're trying to use the haunted castles to your advantage. And 
the other different thing is you're just trying to survive three days. If too many ghosts are out or too many places are haunted, well, you lose. And that's kind of a cool twist on the tile laying because, you know, I'm not a big fan of the original Carcassonne. I understand its uh, broad base in the hobby and its shoulders that a lot of things have been built on. But cooperative? Survive? Okay, you've got me intrigued. So we're hopefully going to be seeing a little bit more of what it can bring to the table when we get a live C at Essen. Now, number five here, this one aptly at this number, even though this wasn't planned, is because it is a five-part campaign game named Revive from Aporta Games. Already, we have had several major channels significantly buzzing about the fact that they think this is a game of the year contender. And what you're going to be doing is you're going to be having asymmetric powers, highly variable setup, no direct conflict or fighting, and you're going to be slowly trying to bring back your civilization from the brink of extinction after an apocalyptic event. And you're doing this over the five stage campaign scenarios to end up with a fully unlocked, upgraded uh, base game to play again in the future after you're done. Two actions per turn, it says playing, exploring, you're going to be populating, and you're going to be building. And depending on what terrain is around you, that's going to be what you're going to have to decide how to do. Milestones, upgrade technology, multi-use cards. Top portion gets you one thing, bottom portion gets you another. Between resources and special abilities, how do you slice the cake when it comes to that a la Gloomhaven style? We're going to see. This has got a lot of hype already, and we haven't even really seen it mainstream in terms of what it can bring to us. So if that has any interest to you, you need to have this one on your radar as well. Look, number six, I can talk about hands-on because hands-on War of the Ring copy. I'm not sure if my review or my thoughts are going to be coming out before or after this video, but I'll tell you right now, this is also going to be, spoilers, probably high on a lot of people's lists. One, to know about, two, to talk about, three, to play, and four, to maybe have as a version of War of the Rings that doesn't require so much overhead, so much minutia, and so much of a time commitment that the original miniature-based one does. And that's why, for me, spoilers, it's probably going to be sitting up very high on the year's overall list at the end of the year, top, top 10, because of several of those factors. But I'll tell you right now, it is quite dissimilar in a lot of its nature by the fact that this is a card-driven game than its predecessor whose name it shares. It reminds me more of the fact that Splendor Duel is reminiscent of Splendor, even though the gameplay is going to be you know, relatively different using the same property. That's what this gives me vibes of. But this needs to be and is on a lot of people's radar. And I'll tell you right now, um, it's a keeper for me. That's what you need to know about it. We'll talk a little bit more in detail, though, in the review about why and what makes it so. Because you're going down two different paths and you have four different decks that you're choosing from. You have a multi-scenario based situation that you can play anywhere from two to four players, depending on how you want to do it, depending on how you want to slice it, even uh, the variable three player count, which doesn't always work out well in other games. So that's number six. Number seven here, uh, Czech Games has uh, really hit the mark with a lot of games uh, generating hype and a lot of interest. And this one, Deal with the Devil, is no less intriguing four players, and this is probably the most divisive element, is you really play four players each time, and that's going to probably put it a lot lower on a lot of people's lists, but with three hidden roles and two opposing paths, that's where the element of intrigue comes in. Highly competitive, they say, Euro game in the medieval era, four players taking on the roles of either mortals, cultists, or even the devil itself. Now think vast, only think more heavy Euro with the ability to blindly trade money for resources to your opponents. This is the asymmetric game for Euro lovers in the description. Dynamic strategies, although this is going to be also the divisive element, they say there's going to be an app involved which is going to keep track of some of the hidden information in the deals that you're making, uh, parts of your souls or your resources or who is trading with who on a turn-by-turn -turn basis. That in itself may also be part of the hidden information. Asymmetric strategies to approach, and we're going to see what Check Games has in store for us. Number eight here, you may recognize the art of Vincent Dutrait, and this is Tribes of the Wind. 
This is going to be another post-apocalyptic game where you're going to be, well, tribes of the wind rebuilding the world on the polluted grounds of the past. Planting forests, decontaminating the areas that are ruined, as well as building villages and temples that have been destroyed previously. The card play is going to be the main element here, as it says that the main card play action is going to be determined not only by what is on your card, but also on the backs of your opponent's cards after they have been played. You're going to have asymmetric special abilities that are going to be able to be unlocked to improve your tribe's powers, as well as when someone builds the fifth village, well, that signals the end of the game. Similarly, we also have the rule book already on Board Game Geek in English, but there will be very limited supply in English over at Essen, it says, at least according to the forums. As well, in Europe, we will see probably a release before the end of the year, but a wide English retail release may be not until early 2023 taking actions, optimizing them, and going forth in traditional Euro style. So we'll get a better sense, hopefully, once we get some more hands-on of how the game flow actually does and how appealing it is besides just the absolutely amazing art. Number nine here, not to be overseen or overlooked at from the recent announcement of Terra Nova, the lighter, more streamlined version of Terra Mystica, this is Rise, also coming from Capstone, which I feel like is going to be more appealing to me personally. You are going to be responsible for the economic and social development of this game, trying to balance your markers on 10 different social and economic tracks. How do you want their lives to be influenced? Politically, militarily, culturally, socially, uh, religiously? Where do you want that power? Where do you want to put the emphasis on? Again, on Capstone's website, just like several of these others, the rule book is already front and center, and you can see the dynamic of these 10 different tracks that you're going to be mitigating and playing down through the use of action cards. Now, there are going to be a lot of different ways that you can go, and you're going to be having to try and figure it out by moving up these tracks, getting the bonuses that they give you, and then subsequently planning out your further turns. How this action system is going to be working is you're going to be placing your factories below these cards in order to select them as your own, and then going from a left to right manner, you will activate them person by person, depending on the initiative order that is laid out. That is what's kind of cool and different, and so we'll see how this actually works in practice. We're going to see a little bit of Essen release, but you can also order it from most of the major retailers, as well as Capstone's current website. All in all, this one appeals to me probably more than Terra Nova, which is why it edged it out on this list, because I have a feeling that it's going to be more suited to my needs as much as I like the idea of Terra Nova in the first place. Now for number 10, we couldn't leave out the big T one, Tiletum, the latest in the T line. Dice management, where these dice are not only to control how many actions you get per turn, but also the resources as you split the values, depending on the dice. If you roll seven total, you have five resources, two actions, or vice versa. You take on the role as rich merchants traveling through Europe, going to various cities to acquire trade contracts, as well as collecting coat of arms, requiring resources to fulfill those contracts, and construction of various monuments to help gain the favor of said noble cities in the fairs and the cities where your business takes place. All in all, I mean, it's got a well-established pedigree with the T previous predecessors that have been put out. How is it going to compare? Are you going to prefer one? You know, what flavor of tea is it going to give us in that sense? So that's going to be intriguing to see, and we'll see how it stacks up when we get more information and it gets more wide availability, just like everything else on this list. Will it stand up the test of time? And that's ultimately the question that you have to ask yourself with any of these games on this list. Not only are you anticipating and, you know, putting them on the hotness, but, you know, will they still be in your collection a year from now? Or are you going to be one of those people selling them on Facebook or Board Game Geek a month after Essen or a month after your pre-order arrives? Because, whoops, turns out it wasn't for you. So, as always, take these lists, mine and everyone else's, with a grain of salt. There you go. Ten that you should have you on your radar, regardless of who you are. Thanks for watching. Stay classy. See you around. You like the new graphics upgrade? You know? Kind of trying a top ten list like this. Also, let me know what you think of that. Would you prefer me down in the lower right-hand corner down here? With the screen, Board Game Geek this way? Or do you prefer the B-roll cut in back and forth. I know a lot of other people do it this way, so I'm trying something new, and if you like it better like this and you're more prone to watch, let me know as well.
Stay classy. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned. Got more where that came from.